Hello, welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. I am your host, Dan Patrick, and today we have an extremely special guest, someone that I've been following for years and years. His work within the realm of trauma, childhood and parenting, disease has just always blown me away. And his name is Gabor Mate. He has a new book called The Myth of Normal, a book that we start off by him explaining why it took him over 10 years to write it, how much information he's collected over that time and where he needed to get to emotionally. I think that society at this point in time needs a book like this, The Myth of Normal, because what is normal? And um, and it should it be the way that we see it right now or should it be different? Gabor really challenges the institutions, the patterns, the mechanisms that have led us to the place that we are right now. And so we talked about you know, childhood and parenting, talked about relationships. When we talked about society, what creates trauma. He's a he's just a really deep thinker. He's very honest and he shared so many amazing stories. I'm just grateful that he got to the point where he could write this book because it's everything that we need. So enjoy this really deep dive with Gabor. Uh, and thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, Please hit subscribe and uh, hit the bell for notifications when we have another episode come out or another clip or any of those magical little bits that we put out there for you guys. Let's talk about what those myths of being normal really are. How are you anyway? You have been on an absolute media terror. Yeah, I've been, I've been sort of the book launch started in Vancouver, British Columbia a week ago Sunday and I then I went to New York for four days. I did a workshop here in LA yesterday and I, you know, yeah, it's, it's on a bit of a tear. But wow. I can't complain because when you spend 10 years working on a book, wow. you're very glad when you have a chance to get out and talk about it, you know? Yeah. Well, that 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 is something that came through so many times in the interviews is just how long this book has been sitting and waiting for you to write it and yeah. that it was difficult to step into that. And also, it's everything you've wanted to say. So, like, what was that? What was that? What was the issue that held you back from writing it? And then was there a moment, an event, something that tipped it over and got you to sit down? And I don't know if you put a pen to paper or you put your fingers to a keyboard, but what started the process? Well, what actually happened was that uh, I've been re re um, gathering material for 10 years now and I collected some like 25,000 different scientific papers and articles, newspaper reports, journal articles read a lot of books interviewed a lot of people and i had a contract to write the book and i just thought no this is too much you know i can't do it i've it's just beyond me and what it really was is that i was so i was kept myself so busy because of my workaholism that there was no space in my brain to to generate something new and something as mm -hmm. solid as this and so it was after a holiday with my wife in Costa Rica, which had a beautiful, relaxing time. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in a hotel in San Francisco having breakfast when all of a sudden this new title of Myth of Normal just flooded into my brain. Mm -hmm. And a new inspiration, a kind of a new vision. The other, the other issue was that when I first started writing the book, my own healing hadn't got that far. So I had a bit more of a morose view of things. So. The book that I've written now is very different than the book I would have written then. It's just, I didn't see the possibility of healing. I, I saw it for others, but not so much for myself. And so mm -hmm. that's, that negativity kind of infused the original version of the book, hmm. which it does this one. So I had to get, in other words, I had to certain, I had to get to a certain place of peace within myself and some space around it for the book to emerge. And that's, that's what happened. Well, there was two things that I thought of as you were talking. One, you said that you had a very relaxing trip in Costa Rica. And for someone that has an issue with, you, you said, working too much, yeah. you finally relaxed. And then it also comes to a question that I wanted to ask you about whether or not we can meet someone beyond or treat someone beyond the level at which we've healed or where we're at emotionally as in if we don't love each of uh, love ourselves can we love another um things so it's uh, i found there seems like there's a magic potion there between like being able to relax being almost the indicator that you had gotten to a point that you were healed enough to write it is that right well i think it works both ways um so, some of us there's this valve of compassion and love 
that sometimes just it opens outwards but not inwards and so you can help a lot of people now you can't help them as much as you could if you were fully healed yourself or more healed that's true mm -hmm. but i've often had the experience i mean this is my fifth book now my other four have been published you know all over the world and i get these emails from everywhere thank you your book changed my life and my mm -hmm. response often was thank you maybe i should read it myself you know <laughs> in other words so humble <laughs> Well, no, because because people describe transformations that they had that I hadn't experienced myself. So to some extent, it's possible to help others, but you can't take them as far as you could unless you're further along the journey yourself. So I think it it, it does work both ways. How is that? Where do you find that information or that ability to connect to those spaces of healing and transformation having not been able to feel it yourself you know it reminds me of something that the great russian dancer nijinsky said about a hundred years ago he was a ballet dancer kind of mm -hmm. the baroshnikov and nurev mm -hmm. of his own day and and he was asked about these incredible leaps that he was able to perform during a ballet sequence and he said when Nijinsky is there, it can't happen. It, it, it's something that just flows through him, but he's, he's, he doesn't create it. it it's like it comes through him. And so I think some people have, I have that ability to some extent to, to channel something that comes through me mm -hmm. to other people or to an audience that maybe I haven't grasped myself and mm -hmm. no, nor can I grasp it, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. I think that's what happens is that, there's a kind of channeling that happens. I'm not the only one that way. I know others, you know, who who can talk well and can help others and something can come through them that's very healing and transformative even, but they haven't got there themselves. And mm -hmm. that's always sad. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. You know, I think that's what happens. Like, what is that? What is that that someone in this life comes in with this ability to connect and come out of your own experience and body into another space another another energy uh what is that well it's a mystery isn't it you, you know you see it a lot actually you see it in artists and uh, performers yeah something comes through them that they can't manifest something even joyful and creative and and very positive that in their own lives they can't manifest at all Mm -hmm. But when they're when they're performing, it, it it just happens. I think that has to do with how some people are born very sensitive and they just connect more naturally with mm -hmm. something outside themselves. Um, mm -hmm. um, I also think it comes through a certain degree of suffering that maybe you've worked through, you know. Mm -hmm. And and also I think you know this is getting maybe more mystical than I usually would venture into but there is a truth there, there's a larger unity that there's a oneness that whether we know it or whether we don't know it but we all belong to and that can manifest it manifests itself through us even if our conscious minds and even our personalities can't quite get a hold of it i think i think that's what that's what's going on yeah that's beautiful i, I would agree is there anything that you do that gets you into that space more or allows for more of that to come through um a situation you put yourself in or a practice that you have i'm i'm not disciplined enough to have a regular practice i mean i really do have an ad i really do have an add brain and and it uh, it, it, it's a challenge for me to meditate or to do yoga regularly for example when i do I but i don't keep it up as much as I know would be good for me. For me, that has come through psychedelic work, actually, um, which is not the same I mean, as, as, as just coming to it more spontaneously. But that, is, that has put me in those spaces sometimes, and that's been helpful for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I definitely want to ask you about that. Um, I've done it myself a few mm. different times. Um, ayahuasca, psilocybin, yeah. MDMA, very yeah. varying degrees of healing tools. Um, yeah. Man, is this the future of therapy? Is this the future of psychology and growth and meeting ourselves? Uh, 
I think that a loss of self is something you've said has been is a problem in society and what keeps us disconnected from from yeah. ourselves, that loss of self through the environment that we're in these days. So psychedelics essentially bring you back to that and go beyond it into spaces, my experience, that you don't you didn't know were there. Yeah. Um aspects of yourself, truths that you wouldn't have always otherwise known. So it seems like this could be a really he a big healing tool moving forward. Yes. Yeah, so in this book, The Myth of Normal, I do have one chapter on psychedelics, which is probably appropriate. So out of 33 chapters, one is on psychedelics, because I don't want to put my eggs all into the psychedelic basket. Right. So I, like on the one hand, it, it can be very powerful and the first time I did ayahuasca, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I just experienced this pure love that had I that had never accessed before. You know, I literally had tears of love uh, rolling down my cheeks. And uh, I thought I had arrived somewhere. Well, as my family could tell you, two days later, I had glimpsed something, but I hadn't arrived anywhere, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and I've, I've, I've led retreats and I've helped people with psychedelics and I've done you know, myself, I think they're a great potential. I don't think they are the answer. I don't think they are the future. I think the future has to be far more with the transformation of people and of social structures and, and the culture itself. We can't rely on one particular modality. What the mm -hmm. psychedelics do do is they offer, they show you a great potential. And um, what shows up, is, as you say, is things you weren't aware of. It's almost like there's a membrane between our conscious minds and all the stuff we carry in our subconscious. And the psychedelics move, remove the membrane. It's almost like you can have a waking dream and experience all the rage, all the hatred maybe, all the terror, all the fear, but all the beauty, all the love, all the oneness, all the unity, all the joy, all the presence mm -hmm. that is in us. And But be awake for the experience and be able to get in relationship to it. Uh, Psychedelics, I think, as you also suggest, I think, can put in touch with that unity that we're all a part of, but we're hardly aware of it most of the time. In fact, in this culture, which is all about competition and aggression, greed and acquisition, we are almost uh, societally mm, propagandized into forgetting that unity and that oneness and that interconnection. And psychedelics can open that up beautifully. But then there's the rest of life. You know? Yeah. And what you glimpse and experience in the psychedelic space, the question is how to make those same values, which people can attain without psychedelics, how to make those values work in our regular lives, in our social lives, in our culture. And that that's a question that goes way beyond psychedelics, I think. Sure. That's culture and society and the patterns that they keep us in yeah. outside of ourselves that pull us back in so quickly. Um, yeah, what do you think is the, what do you think holds us back the most when we come out of that? Like we, we get into these spaces, we feel love and then we get back into our routine. Like if there were a few things to change, what would it be? Like when you came back, what, what did you think this, this, this is, this is what society pulls me back into the heart with, with the hardest. I think there's two forces pulling us back into our ordinary, less unitarian, less connected self. One is just um, how our personalities are formed in the first place, which is very often, in my contention, the result of responses to traumatic events or traumatic pressures that happen to children in this society quite a lot. And so we form these defensive structures that we call the personality. And the personality doesn't want to give up too easily because when stuff happens in childhood that makes you defensive and makes you afraid or makes you um, disconnected, mm -hmm. um, those structures have been living in you and dominating your life, depending how old you are, for, for decades. They don't just disappear. They don't just dissolve. You might get a momentary respite from them in the psychedelic space, but they haven't all of a sudden evaporated. And the Buddha talked about what he called our habit energies. So our habit energies are the thoughts and emotional patterns and psychological structures that are ingrained in our brains and our nervous systems and our bodies, and they just reassert themselves almost automatically. 
Then there's society, which is all about how we look to others and what other people think of us and how we fit in and how we please others or how we compete with others. And then we go back into that world. And so it's no wonder that between the inner habit energies that have dominated our lives and then the external pressures, we quickly can lose the glow of that spiritual or psychological insight that we gained either through some spiritual experience or through psychedelics or with an encounter with nature perhaps so it's difficult to maintain that and then above all there's what my friend the psychiatrist uh, dan siegel calls the um the the, the myth of the solo self and you know, like we all fundamentally every ego believes that it's a unit that it's a separate unit sufficient unto itself you know and we believe in our, our separateness and in this culture reinforces that belief of course so it's it, huh. it's it's not an easy not an easy path yeah that brings me back to um uh, so i did a uh, a little bit of a hero's dose of psilocybin i took five grams and it took me huh. to a really distant place and i went really far away but one yeah. of the main things that happened in the experience was that and it was facilitated this was this was with a facilitator and yeah um was that i knew that being human wasn't real mm. and but i wanted to be human yes and so the first thing that i had to agree to in order to build constructs to get back to being human mm -hmm. was i had to agree to the mind yeah that's right and i was like great okay perfect fine let's go i want i want to see my family again i want to see my dogs again yeah. um because in the early part of the experience i didn't know how i was ever going to be human again because i knew it wasn't real and so the, so yes i had to agree to the mind which in you know for for me felt like the ego it felt like the stories yeah. this was the lie because being human wasn't real the mind was the lie which is the stories and the ego yeah have you ever and, experienced yeah. anything like that not personally, but I can tell you about somebody I talked to yesterday. You might know the name. Her name her name is Anita Morjani. Do you know that name? No. Okay, Anita Morjani wrote a book um, called Dying to Be Me. Uh -huh. And um, here was a woman who, you know, in my view of illness as a physician, I've noticed who gets sick and who gets chronic illness and malignancy. It's people who really repress themselves in order to fit in with others. And that's mm -hmm. a defensive response to childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. Anita was one of these people. Mm -hmm. And she had this terminal lymphoma, stage four lymphoma. She was in a coma. And the doctor said, this is in, you know, she lives in LA, which is where I'm right. Um, she was in a coma. And the doctors were telling her family to prepare for her death within a few hours. Oh my goodness. And then Anita had this out of body near death experience hmm. where she saw her whole life, where she saw her, she had never been herself her whole life. That's why the title of her book, Dying to Be Me, it took near death to make her become herself. But then she was in this realm where she could have chosen to stay there, but she had to make a decision do I stay there in this beautiful realm of unity and light? Or do I come back into my mind and my body? And it sounds very similar to your experience. Mm -hmm. I she had said, that choice too. And she said, I made she said, I made a choice to come back. Now, mm -hmm. within four or five days, her lymphoma had disappeared. And within a few days, she was out of hospital and she's never been sick since. Now, this is not totally unheard of, and I can sort of explain it in certain physiological ways. Mm -hmm. But the point is she was facing that same choice that you had made and she just decided to come back and yeah. coming back of course means coming back into the body coming back into the mind now her life is very different than it used to be prior to her experience mm -hmm. but she still faces the challenges of coming up against the personality and the ingrained habits and all that stuff so now she had that experience on the verge of death you had it with the psilocybin but they sound very similar you might yeah. want to talk to her sometime that would be very interesting. It was, there was a choice. I didn't add that yeah. part to the story, but essentially I was in this, what felt like baseline reality being like a waveform. So it's just kind of waveform. And there was an energy or a group of entities, a voice, a knowing. And this energy was like 
come this way. And it was as if there was this light shaft that went up like energy, mm. very light, light energy shaft. And they're like, yeah. come on, if you, you, you know, if you want to be an ascended master, you have to lose, you have to let go of form. That was what they said. And I was like, Whoa, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to go there yet. I'm, I'm my family, my dogs, my, my friends. And so I chose not to. Um, but it's very interesting because I've talked to a couple of people and they, that is a part a lot of times of plant medicines is there's a choice with yeah. a big enough, do I think a big enough dose is somewhat necessary. I had to tell you, but I've had a dose triple than what, triple what you had, you know? Wow. How was but, that? Well, that's another story, but I'm going to tell you something else. <laughs> I, I, I heard you say some, somewhere that relationships are some of the most important learning that you do you know sure. and um so my wife actually had one of those experiences that you described mm. not with psychedelics and not on the verge of death but we were having a very difficult time in our relationship some decades ago and she was really suffering and um the suffering was very much had to do with how i was showing up or not showing up mm. and she surrendered to it she's at some point she said all i can do is surrender to it and she had this direct energy of her form disappearing. Everything just becomes energy. Everything becomes unitary. She saw my perfection. She saw the perfection, the perfection of this husband who was not being very kind or very nice at that time. Mm -hmm. So she had a very similar experience. So what I'm saying is that these experiences are of unity and energy, pure energy. You know, I can't describe it as articulately as she can, but she did a, that experience. So what I'm saying is that Clearly, there's something about us that that usually we're not in touch with that is capable of going to those spaces, um, and it does not necessarily take psychedelics. It, it, in her case, nothing like that was involved at all. Not yeah, to, yeah. So, well, the other story didn't include psychedelics either. That was yeah. a near-death yeah. experience, but it wasn't. A, it was there was no substance taken no. to create no. that altered state. I agree. No. What's it going to take? I just have this theory that there's so much going on in the world. There's propaganda, there's lies, there's fake news, there's all these different things. And we, how do we know what to trust? And so the feeling I have is that we're being called to learn how to use our inner guidance system, call it our conscience, our intuition. Uh, in order to be able to be a, essentially the lie detector for ourselves. What do yeah. you think about that? Well, I, I, I think there's a lot of truth in it. And the question is, what makes that so difficult? So um, I do think that in this society, the way we raise children and the way we live, it alienates, from, alienates us from our, our true nature. Um, mm -hmm. See, you never met an animal who's not in touch with their gut feelings and their intuitions. <laughs> That's you know? so true. You know, and and human beings, as they evolved over millions and hundreds of thousands of years, they lived very much in intuition, in, in connection with their bodies. I mean, if you're a hunter gatherer, which is what we were for most of our existence, mm -hmm. how long do you survive out there in the wild if you're not in touch with your gut feelings? <laughs> not very long. So, the question then is, what happens in modern society that separates us from ourselves? Right. And that's where I think trauma comes in. So that w w trauma for me is, is the essence of it is a disconnect from yourself. And, and that could be caused by, you know, terrible things that happen, such as abuse and, and so on, or, or neglect, where mm -hmm. it's too painful to be in your own body. So you disconnect as a way of survival. Mm hmm which to me is at the basis as a physician, in my view, it's at the basis of a lot of physical illness and mental illness as well. Um, but generally how we raise children is, like one of the needs of children, one of the essential needs of children, which we don't appreciate, is the freedom to experience all their emotions. Now, in this society, a lot of parents are advised that certain emotions are allowed in children and some are not. So children get the message very early that if I'm fully myself, if I'm completely myself, I won't be acceptable. Mm -hmm. But they have to disconnect from themselves in order to be acceptable to their families and to their schools and to their culture. Mm -hmm. And so 
when you ask the question about what will it take, I think what it'll take is for us to recognize just how traumatized we are and how disconnected we are and how, how we live our lives in this particular society, how we raise our children, actually disconnects people from their true selves. And then it becomes a real struggle to reconnect. And sometimes it takes some very difficult experiences to to wake us up to just how disconnected we have become from ourselves. and. Uh, so I think it's a large social question that you're asking. No. Yes, people can work on it, and they have to on the individual level. On the individual level, it's my responsibility to connect with my gut feelings and my authentic self. And uh, I can't wait for society to do it for me. But I think it has to happen both on the individual and on the social level as well. I mean, have you met a one-day-old baby that wasn't in touch with themselves? Right. You know, right. so you know, there is something happens, doesn't it? We're yeah. born that way, and then something happens to disconnect us. And we have to look at what are the things that disconnect us from ourselves and how do we reverse that very tragic trend. The environment that we raise kids is so much different than it was in times of the past where there was a community, there was elders, grandparents, yeah. aunts, uncles, cousins. There was a whole community, and so... Now it's you get one or two, hopefully, people that are imprinting or projecting their own patterns onto you and what they think is good or normal. Uh, and in the past, there used to be 20. Yeah. How big of a problem is that? Well, you just summarized several chapters of my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... There's a story I like to tell that I read recently. Um, in my book, The Myth of Normal, I quote a psychologist, her name is Darcia Narvez, and she now retired as a professor at Notre Dame University. Mm -hmm. And she studied hunter-gatherer groups mm -hmm. and, 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 and indigenous people, how they parent. And they parented exactly the way you described. In communities, children had many parents. I mean, they knew their biological parents and had a special relationship with them, but they were really parented by the whole community. So they felt very safe, very contained, um, very connected. That's yeah. our that's how we evolved as human beings. And we lived that way for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Until almost a blink of an eye ago, really. Um, and in modern society, the separation is getting worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. um, Darcy has just written a new book, which will be published next year, uh, for which I wrote the foreword. And uh, it's called The Evolved Nest. And the Evolved Nest is the context in which we evolved as human beings. And she compares us to other animals. So the story that I loved in her new book, which is out next year, you know, when an elephant mother gives birth, you know what happens? This is incredible. Mm -hmm. So when the mother elephant goes into labor, all the other mothers stand in a circle. And when the newborn hits the ground, they all stroke the newborn with their trunks. Wow. So birth itself was a communal experience. Wow. You know, and that certainly meant to be the way it is for human beings. So in the book, I have a chapter on prenatal experiences. We know already that stresses on pregnant women translate into stress on the baby that in a way that changes the baby's physiology and brain development, affects it in negative ways, in ways that you can trace decades later. Now, wow. how well do we look after pregnant women? I mean, as a physician, I was trained to do the blood tests and the ultrasounds and the physical examinations, maybe talk about nutrition. Nobody ever suggested that I talk to a woman about her emotional states and how mm -hmm. stressed she was and what kind of support she was receiving. Mm -hmm. Then there's the birth process. <laughs> and again, you know, I delivered a lot of babies as a physician. Thank God for modern obstetrics. So I'm not here to militate against the, uh, you know, the, the miracles of, of, of modern medicine, but we've carried it way too far. We approach <laughs> birth as a disaster waiting to happen. And we interfere with it, mechanize it, and lights and machines and noise. And we're actually interfering with the natural process that's meant to help the infant and the mother bond. And we're, with our interference, we're actually already interfering with the mother-infant bond. Wow. Then there's the fact that in the United States, where we're speaking right now, I'm Canadian, but in the U.S. here, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. Now that amounts to a massive abandonment of infants. 
because that infant physiologically and emotionally needs to be with the mom for much longer. We create the separation right from the beginning. Right. We get we get it wrong right from the beginning. Culture and society just honoring yeah. working hard and um, sacrificing and yeah. you know just prioritizing everything other than you know children and well being and mental health. It's all about status yes. and money, keeping your job, yes. getting a promotion. Well, my friend, the um, I don't know if you know him. His name is Rafi. He's a children's singer. Um, He's a ch world famous children's troubadour. He sang at the first Clinton inauguration, and it's just a world famous children's singer. Um, generations of kids have grown up singing his songs, and he was telling me that he was lying there in bed at night, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and all of a sudden he he sat a bolt upright, and his thought child honoring came into his head, and he said, hmm. "What a better society than honors children." If we just ask ourselves, what mm. does it take to create a world that honors the real needs of children? We would do everything differently. Yeah. The foods we sell kids or the, the products that, you know, we wouldn't be pushing addictive devices on them at an early age. We wouldn't be separating from the mothers at two weeks of age. Mm -hmm. Just that very question of what would it take to create a world that honors the needs of children? Turns out, that's how aboriginal people indigenous people actually lived is they lived in a way that honored children well i know you've spoken so much about um children and um holding them when they're crying and yeah um taking care of their needs um so what is it that creates a securely attached child sure well i think you told me you have dogs is that right I do. What does it take to create a secure attachment with a dog? I just, yes, I, I actually just had something come through last night that was just honor what they want to do. Honor what they want to do. If she's picking my hand up, just pet her. If she yeah. drops the ball in front of me, throw the ball. Like, yeah, those are her loves, and that's essentially her language. Well, so, so there's certain brain circuits that we share with all mammals, including dogs. Okay, now, um, and those brain circuits, that's our biological, psychological nature, they dictate that children have certain essential needs, what I call irreducible needs, needs that if they're not met, they lead to a distorted development and, 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 and lack of health. So what mm -hmm. are the irreducible needs of children? They're not that different from the irreducible needs of other mammals. First of all, um, an attachment relationship with parents is absolutely secure. Uh, where the child is just welcomed, that you are the person that we want. You are the person we want in this world. Mm -hmm. so secure attachment, unconditional. Um, you don't have to be pretty. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be compliant. You don't have to be cute. You don't have to be clever. You just, you're the one we want. That's the first one. The, sec the second point is within that relationship, the child has to be able to rest. By rest, we mean, or I mean, or my psychologist friend who gave me this concept means the child shouldn't have to work to make the relationship work because the relationship should be unconditional. Mm. So in a lot of homes, parents love their kids. It's not a question of do they love them, but if the parents are having stresses and problems, the child will very often take on the responsibility of trying to make it better by fitting in, by being nice, by being compliant, by suppressing their own feelings. Sure. This is typical in homes where there's alcoholism, by the way. A mm -hmm. child will work to make the relationship work with the parent. Mm -hmm. A child, so children need rest where they don't have to work to make the relationship work. Yeah. So the third need I have already mentioned, which is the freedom to experience all of our emotions and be held through those emotions. A lot of parents in this society, there's a lot of behavior psychologists and parenting so-called experts who tell parents, when a child is angry, give them a time out. In other words, what you do is you threaten the child with the loss of what's most important to them, which is that attachment relationship. And you say to them, this attachment is conditional. If you have emotions that I don't like, and if you manifest those emotions, you're going to be deprived of me, which is your biggest need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. 
then the child is in this dilemma. Okay, I'm a two-year-old frustrated little angry little kid, as kids often are, but if I'm in my anger, my parents will reject me. That's not what the parent intends to do, but that's the effect of the time out. Right. Unit right. Time out. Yeah. So the child will then suppress themselves, disconnect them from themselves in order to maintain the relationship. So the third need is the freedom to feel all our emotions. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is what you mentioned about dogs. We have a need to play, spontaneous mm -hmm. free play out there in nature. That's wired into our brains. Play, it turns out, according to all the research, is much more important for brain development than cognitive uh, learning. Really? And so there's all this stuff about baby Einsteins and teaching kids uh, all this stuff early and, you know, video games to promote brain development. It's all nonsense. What promotes brain development is healthy, spontaneous play. That's why animals play. That's why your puppies play. That's why bear cubs play. And in our society, we've almost totally deprived kids of yeah. free, free spontaneous play. So when you say what it takes to develop a healthy child, meet those four conditions. And you'll have an emotionally healthy, balanced, connected, grounded, uh, confident child. So that play is not being is not taking and putting something on them like here's a toy, here's no. a baby Einstein game. It's allowing the child to organically, naturally lead into something that they're interested in, whether it be rolling on the floor or climbing a tree or whatever it may be. It's their own innate direction. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you know, a, a kid who is. Um still connect to themselves you give them a stick and a puddle and they're busy the whole day you know you know here's, the little boat. here's my little boat swimming in the pot you know in the ocean you know but but we've taken that away from kids yeah you know yeah. and 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 from that point of view the digital technology that young children are exposed to is simply toxic it's just toxic for them and it actually interferes with their brain development what should be the rule on that because in my opinion it sure looks like you give a kid new technology that's touch and they know what to do with it right away it's almost like they yeah. had kids and they're sort of you know primitive natural instinctual brains helping lead technology so <laughs> it sure seems like it because they know what to do so what's the right rules for that well in in writing the book i talked to um a couple of experts on this including um um a psychiatrist called Shimi Kang, who a Harvard trained psychiatrist who studied this question and has written about it, digital technology. And she points out that the digital companies actually target these gadgets in a way to activate those circuits in the brain that are most prone to get addicted in children. They call that neuromarketing. Neuromarketing, mm -hmm. targeting mm -hmm. the nervous system. This isn't conspiracy theory. This is conspiracy reality, you know. Yeah. And uh, I would say when to introduce uh, screens and digital material to kids, well, let's ask the same question about other things. We might all agree, I mean, unless you have an alcoholism tendency, that, that alcohol or a glass of wine can be a pleasant social lubricant and people have used it for, but would you give it to a one-year-old, you know? And, and 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 we also agree that sex is both beautiful and necessary, but you don't want five year olds engaging in it. Right. And so 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 the answer is you introduce it when the children are emotionally mature enough to handle it. Hmm. And that's not so much a chronological thing as a your relationship with the child, how secure is the child, how much influence can you have on the child in regulating how much digital screen they use. But when you give it to them early, they just get addicted to it, and you try them, peel them off it. They be like, they behave like addicts and withdrawal. So that's the indicator: is how do they act and react when yeah. you yeah. give them a time limit or take it from them? If I was a parenting now, I would not have a screen in my house except in my office until my kids are well into their school age years. I'd have them play outside. I'd have them go hiking. I'd have them do. All kinds of stuff. And you know what? When you give them that, they won't fall behind. When you introduce it to them, they catch up like that. And if they're 
grounded in themselves and self-regulated, then you can give them the machinery and you're no longer afraid that they'll be seduced by it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the first thing to get cut in school is like gym class now. So, uh, and art and art. That art and music, in other words, music, all all the creative, playful stuff, Mm -hmm. when it's financial, this happened in, I talk about this in the book, this happened in Quebec and Canada, like during COVID, they had to cut certain things. What did they cut? They cut gym, they cut art, they cut music. Mm-hmm. Now you ask people, you ask most people, most adults, compare the importance of music in your life to the importance of algebra. What would they say? You know? Oh my gosh, I play music <laughs> all day, every day. It's helped guide my energy. <laughs> but educationally, we get it all backwards. Yeah. We put the intellectual and the left brain cognitive ahead the ahead of the emotional right brain creative mm-hmm. again it's just a negative influence on child development right what are the i've always i've thought of this many times there's a couple of topics that fascinate me one of them is children um well both of these two topics that fascinate me the most one being children i don't have kids and the other one i don't have either which is anxiety and so i'm fascinated by them because i don't understand them um so one of the questions as my sister has three girls and about to have her fourth is (laughs) yeah is of course what creates a securely attached child but then also and now I'm going to get to a question I was going to ask you early, early, which is, do we all have trauma? So may I say something about anxiety first, since you mentioned yeah, it? And of course. Yeah, we can talk about that for sure. With the trauma. So in our brains, we have certain circuits that we share with animal, and animals that I mentioned, emotional yeah. circuits. Mm-hmm. We have one for anger. We have one for caring or love. We have them for lust. We have them for play. We have them for seeking. We have them for fear. Um, we also have a circuit for panic and grief. Okay. And the reason we have that is because when a young child loses the parent or the parental contact, they should experience panic and grief. Sure. Because that will then make them vocalize and cry for the parental presence, which should set the parent running Yeah. support the child. Yeah. Now, in a culture that tells parents not to pick up their kids when they're crying in order to sleep train them, that panic and grief circuit gets overactivated. And, oh. and in the culture of disconnection, when parents are less and less because of this, not because they don't love their kid, but because of the stresses in their life and because of the loss of community that you talked about early in our conversation, adults are less and less available for kids kids develop a lot of panic, a lot of anxiety. So it, so if you look at what's happening with children right now, more and more of them are being medicated for anxiety and ADHD and self-harm and mm-hmm. uh, problems, and more and more children actually are committing suicide according to all the studies. You know, there's something happening on a cultural level that makes our kids very anxious. And that something is the loss of connection to uh, a nurturing adult community, you know? so. Now, there was an article in the New York Times um, three weeks ago, as we speak now, front page article about this teenager who's on 10 different psychiatric medications, 10 psychiatric medications. And this is a trend in the United States, especially because we've so lost the plot when it comes to raising healthy children that all we can try and do according, well, not all, but the dominant tendency is just to diagnose kids with these disorders and to medicate them rather than dealing with what is making them so anxious in the first place. Why right. can't they, you know? Now, to come back to your question about trauma then, uh, in this society, I mean, the title of the book is The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And my contention is, is that very few of us escape without being traumatized to one degree or another. Now. To explain that, I'd have to tell you what what I see trauma as being. Because yeah. if you think of trauma as only terrible things happening, which they do happen to a lot of kids. I mean, a lot of kids are abused physically or emotionally or sexually. There's studies, several studies now recently, that showed that just spanking kids can be as traumatic as physical abuse. Right, right. Because of the way you register it. Because of the way the child registers it. 
that the people that um, the people that are meant to provide him or her with safety are not hitting them. Right. That's really confusing and traumatic for a child. So uh, I'm not talking about moral questions here. I'm talking about studies that have, are showing that even the act of spanking, if it happens over time, can have significant traumatic effects. So, mm -hmm. so trauma is what happens when terrible things happen. But if you look at the word trauma itself, what it means is it's a wound. It's a psychic wound. And you can wound kids not only by doing bad things to them, but also by not giving what they need, by depriving them of their emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Now, for reasons that we already talked about, so many kids are wounded. But you don't pick up a child when they're crying. You're wounding them. Because like any animal that that cries for the parent, tr try and tell a mother baboon not to pick up their infant when they're crying. Mm. Try and tell a mother bear not to respond to the infant's distress. But mm -hmm. we tell parents this all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so that to me, that's traumatizing. That wounds the society psychologically. So in this society, I don't think, I think there's a real trauma spectrum. And I mm -hmm. think most of us find ourselves on it someplace or another. I, I certainly have, but so do my children because the problem with trauma is that if we're not aware of it, they haven't worked it out. We are, we are unwittingly pass it on to the next generation. Not because we don't love them, not because we're not doing our best, but because our best is limited by our own trauma. So right. I think in this society, it's rare to see um, people who don't carry some degree of trauma. Is that like a big T, capital T, lowercase T kind of traumas where it says things that are super, that are much more aggressive, like rape yeah. or abuse versus, you know, just taking a toy at the wrong moment or not being picked up at the right moment? Um, is, not, that, not, is that sort not, of the separation? Yeah, yeah. Or, yes. Or, or the scale or the not, spectrum. Not, not, not being picked up, um, not, not having the emotions honored and recognized. Yeah, not being held. And, and let's let's say a little kid is upset, and and the parent unwittingly and well meaning this says, "Get over it, you know, no big deal." That's not what the child needs. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, it's projection. They, they, it's they, just they, projecting. They, they need to be have the experience that the parent can stay calm and regulated to the child's upset, mm -hmm. not react, and hold the child through the upset, so the child learns. But yeah, I can have suffer pain and distress, but it passes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can handle it. So the children learn self-regulation by the adults being self-regulated and helping to regulate the child. Because, <laughs> as you know, as again Dan Siegel, the psychiatrist I mentioned, points out, the the child learns self-regulation by employing the more mature circuits of the adult brain. Of so, the parent or themselves. Of the of the the child uses the more mature circuits of the parents' adult right. brain right. to help regulate their own immature right. brain circuits. Well, that so, can be really tricky depending on what the parents like. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> so if the parents are not supported and self-regulated, the child never develops self-regulation. So the point is not coddling kids. It's not coddling. It's just holding them and loving them and helping them learn that they can move through these difficult states. And they mm -hmm. pass, and they can handle it. Mm -hmm. well, you know? That was what I was wanting to ask: was what are the tools that you give them to navigate? Asking, do we all have trauma? Because say you create, you know, you create a securely attached child, and they they are able to interface with the world in a in a yeah. healthy way. Um, but and it seems from my experience and an opinion that everyone has trauma. So. Even when, if you're able to raise those unicorn children that are securely attached, I don't know where they are, um, but I'm definitely not one of them. But what is it that you teach them as a skill um, to be able to have the tools later in life to be able to deal with a pattern that's unhealthy that they want to get out of, which is essentially, from, for me, what has been my indication of a trauma is a yeah. pattern that repeats that I just finally notice. Yeah. Well, so you frame the question in terms of what skills do you teach them? And I will push back on that one. Okay. Because it's not a matter of skills. Mm. 
in this society, we really hung up on teaching kids skills about how to do this, how to do that. But you know what? Child development actually proceeds on a scaffolding of emotion. So our emotional self develops long before our cognitive self that learns mm. skills. Mm. And the right side of the, both in terms of our evolution as, as, as animals, but also in terms of the individual development of the human creature, the right emotional side of the brain develops before the left cognitive side. Oh. So, so it's not a matter of teaching skills. It's uh -huh. a matter of providing the conditions where the emotional scaffolding can develop in a secure and strong way so that then the cognitive skills can be built on top of it. Uh. So, it's not, so it's not a question of skill building or skill teaching. Uh -huh. It's a question of providing the right conditions for healthy development. Wow. You know, the uh -huh. skills come later. The problem is, for a lot of us, because we don't have that secure grounding for emotional development, when something happens later on in life that upsets us, we're very quickly thrown back into a very immature state mm. you know, of being. And I mean, that's to speak mm -hmm. of myself. I mean, the mm -hmm. book opens with an example of that, you know, of, of myself. Not very young, this is at age 71, reacting like I was a one-year-old. But that's because the emotional architecture of my brain, given the conditions that I was living under as an infant, just didn't develop the way I ought to have. That's not an excuse. And it's not like I can keep saying, oh, I can't help it. It's my responsibility to grow up at any age, you know. Yeah. But when you say to somebody, grow up in a kind of critical way, in a sense, you're being accurate. Because, yeah. because but the question is, what happened? that they didn't grow up in the first place. That wasn't their fault. They didn't have the conditions. So what I'm saying is, it's not skill building or teaching, it's providing the conditions for healthy development. Mm -hmm. I have heard you say that children, when they act out or start screaming or have an emotional reaction, um, are acting out what they don't have words for yet. Well, and I thought that was fascinating. And it made me wonder, how do you help give a child words? And is mm. that part of the emotional conditioning or the safe environment? Or is that part of the is that part of the structure, the scaffolding is giving things words? Well, let's take a, a very common very with very disturbing example of acting out. But by the way, when Usually when we talk about kids acting out, what are we talking about? We're talking about kid being obstreperous or oppositional or aggressive or rude or disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the phrase means. Mm. It's a very simple English phrase. Acting out means that you act out something that you haven't got the words to say in language. So in a game of charades, where you're not allowed to speak, <laughs> what do you have to do? Yeah. You have to act it out. or. If you land in a country where nobody spoke your language and you wanted to portray hunger, you'd have to act it out. <laughs> well, that's what kids are doing. And the question ah. is, what are they acting out? Right. Well, what are they acting out is their frustration and their pain and their unmet needs. Now, in our society, which is so behavior oriented, so but how do you get the right behavior? All we try and do is to squelch the behaviors that we don't like and to promote the behaviors that we do like. But we, we focus the attention on behavior modification of the child rather than the child's emotional needs and healthy development. Mm -hmm. And the two are not the same. So let's take a distressing example like bullying. And so mm -hmm. bullies are, nobody likes them unless they go into politics, in which case we elect them into power, but that's another story. <laughs> I won't go there right now. Um, but, but, um, you know, bullies is a real phenomenon in our society. And especially there's a lot of bullying on the internet. Kids are really suffering. Sure. Now, it turns out when you do the research on bullying, not only does bullying have unhealthy consequences for the bullied, the bully themselves equally goes up to be a, pro a kid with physical and mental health issues. It's harmful for him as well, or her as well, or them as well. Sure. Now, we can squelch the behavior of bullying by so-called 
zero tolerance policies that most school districts have adopted. But I looked at literature on bullying. There was a major study that looked at zero tolerance. And you know what the article was called? Zero tolerance, zero evidence. No evidence whatsoever that that works. The reason it doesn't work is it doesn't address what the kid is acting out. Now, what is the kid acting out? Uh, a need. A need for? A need for connection. A need, yeah, to, be a need, seen, connect. need to be understood. Need to be a held. Need, a, need, a need for a need to make, make a need to be important. Yeah. You know? And why does the child have a need to be important? Because the adults in their lives are missing. The adults that need to make the child feel important, not because of what the child does or how they show up, but just because they exist. That's missing for those kids. And you always look at their backgrounds, it's something missing for them. And mm -hmm. so then the, the the way you deal with bullying. Is not through separating from them and banishing them, but by giving them strong, powerful, loving adult attachments. Right. You know, in other words, you don't respond to the behavior, you respond to the need. And that bully, when you give them that, they transform very rapidly. Very yeah. rapidly, you know. And, um, but we get it wrong. We, we focus on the, acting out which is the behavior rather than what is being acted out right which is the child's need a lot of people who listen to this may think i'm just trying to coddle and reward bad behavior no i'm not i'm trying to understand why children behave the way they do and how most effectively we can help them to the benefit of the child other children and society and we can only do that if we understand what this is all about and why are so many kids behaving that way these days you mentioned one, I think it was the first rule you had talked about a child being wanted, truly mm -hmm. being wanted. Yeah. And I have this theory on whether it be music or an interview, any kind of human interaction, that there's some that just resonate with people. They resonate deeply. A song can move you. An interview can grab you, can hit hit home. And I just I have a I have a theory that there's a frequency carried with truth. Mm -hmm. And that we feel it and we know it. Maybe the words aren't even that much different, but the energy is different. And so oh. I wonder if that is one of the big issues is whether or not a parent. And this is hard to probably, very hard to face if you're a parent. I'm not a parent. Um, do you really want that child? Yeah. Like, is the frequency of your information in truth? Like, are you just doing the right thing, just saying the right thing, but not feeling it? And in your experience, have you noticed any correlation between the truth oh. of the information and what they're saying and they're not being a connection so therefore the child doesn't feel it even if you're doing the right things you can love a child you can genuinely love a child but if at the same time there's any part of you that doesn't want some aspect of the child the child would feel that <laughs> kids are very sensitive they now be able they may not be able to articulate it but they'll sense it and they'll experience it as a wound, you know? Yeah, hey. that, that, that's that's my view, you know? Um, let alone children who are really not wanted. I mean, I've, I've known people who, more than a few person who, say under the influence of a psychedelic, will find themselves back in the womb and sense their mother's stresses, you know? And, and the fact that they weren't, actually welcomed and that's not the parents fault maybe they weren't ready to have a child maybe um they were going through stresses that 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 um well you know in the book i i quote my wife in one of the chapters and, and she's talking to the the infant inside her belly with one of her children and and she's saying something like my dear little child all this adrenaline and all this cortisol that I'm experiencing right now, it's not because of you. And your dad, once they get to know you, will want you as much as I do. Mm -hmm. But he can't feel you moving in your belly like I can. Oof. And and she was so right. 
because our relationship was at that time a very difficult one and i was this workaholic doctor who wasn't just emotionally available and in fact could be very irritable i could be very irritable and emotionally let's say unpleasant when i was at home my wife was talking to the infant trying to protect her from the impact of that yeah now we know from all kinds of studies as i mentioned earlier that that has an impact on the infant already in the womb you know so people are very sensitive and we are interconnected and nobody's more connected to anybody else than the young child to the parent mm -hmm. so when the parent is going through emotionally the child will download on one level or another and and i've had people uh tell me about when they have psychedelic experiences they they sense the pains and stresses and even when they were not wanted by the parent oh, wow. they, they feel intense pain when they have that experience mm. i got goosebumps when you shared that which to me is an indicator of yes it's basically just my body saying yes that's true um yeah. when you shared those those words that your wife had said um so yeah i'm i'm sure that that was very important to the baby um like if we fast forward a little bit to being an adult and being in adult situations what is it when someone projects what's behind a projection well i need to know what you mean by projection um just uh an opinion perhaps uh whether or not you're doing something right or wrong or um even just getting offended let's maybe just say that like let's say let's just flip it the other way what if somebody said something to me and i get offended what does that mean that's a very interesting question i'm just so uh, i learned this somewhere this is not original to me but like, um what if i complimented you right now on your beautiful green hair what would be your reaction <laughs> Well, I'd be a little confused because you said beautiful, but then green, and that's not accurate. So, okay. But what if I kept insisting that I you have green hair? What, what would you how would you react to that? Um, I might think that I obviously think that you look through life in a diff through a different lens, but I'd probably say thank you. Yeah, would you really? But you wouldn't. But you would realize that I wasn't seeing reality, right? Of course. Yeah, it's not the same. At, at the very least, I'm colorblind. Yes, exactly. And you wouldn't take it personally, or would you? Ah, oh, it seems so so left field. Exactly. Even though I was projecting something totally untrue onto you, but it wouldn't have said you because you see that as my problem. Yes. Okay. However, I may say something else to you that is equally a projection, but if it's a place where you've already been wounded before, then you'd get offended. So, um, if somebody calls me stupid, I, I don't get offended because I happen to know that I'm pretty bright, you know. Right. So I have no, I have no insecurity. I have no insecurity about my intelligence. Mm -hmm. But there are things that people can say to me that'll get me offended because maybe I've been wounded there before and I don't quite, and somehow I buy into what they're saying on some level, and that sort of offends me. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. To put it another way, uh, when I'm offended, uh, it's because there's something in me that got touched that I haven't resolved yet. Otherwise, I would just see it as a projection. You know, I wouldn't take it personally. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know so that it's word. An indicator. So it's, it's an indicator of a wound. Exactly. That's that's what I'm saying. So we have, we have this word called triggered. We're triggered, right? Yeah. Yep. So, and I often talk about this. So a trigger. When you look at what a trigger actually is in real life, it's a very small thing on a big weapon, mm -hmm. which carries ammunition and an explosive charge. Now, if somebody triggers you, it's only because you're carrying the ammunition and the explosive charge. That explosive charge where you explode is precisely where you were wounded a long time before, mm -hmm. and you haven't killed the wound yet. Otherwise, you'd never be triggered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's no ammunition or explosive charge there somebody can pull the trigger all they want nothing will happen mm -hmm. so so the question then is 
do we put our attention if we want to take responsibility for ourselves if as adults we want to grow up and by the way most of us adults have to grow up you know um, um if we want to take responsibility for our growth we have to realize what is the explosive charge in me in other words what is the wound that's not healed and if i heal that wound that projection will be seen as only a projection is their problem you know nothing to do with me but if i haven't healed that wound i'll be triggered and then i'll blame the other person for triggering me but actually i wouldn't be the only one to point out or the first one to point out that these people that trigger us they're our best teachers amen be because they they let us know and this happens in relationships all the time doesn't it and lessons are never easy no no they're not they're painful uh, so I guess it could be said that projection is just it's very much the same. When you project something, it's a wound being poked, essentially, um, whether it be the way something is done or the way somebody said something. Uh, maybe they said something like, hey, what are you doing? And maybe it just triggers something from childhood and that it puts you into this space where you then project, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Because maybe you as a child were criticized for doing things wrong all the time. And so there's essentially the projection is just a complement to triggering. Is that true? Well, exactly. And so like I when I think about it, people questioning my intelligence would never trigger me. Right. But but, but I can be but but I can be triggered when I think about it. So when when people criticize me for saying things that I never said. You know, or when they interpret my words in ways that are totally opposite to what I intended, mm -hmm. I notice that if I'm honest with myself, that can set off something in myself. Why? Because one of my childhood wounds was not being seen for who I was. The children need to be seen for exactly who they are. Yeah. And I wasn't. I'm not blaming my parents here. I'm just saying that's what happened. Yeah. So when I'm not seen, that can be can be a, that for me can be a trigger no somebody not seen is a function of their own blindness nevertheless their blindness can trigger me because not being seen is one of my core wounds mm -hmm. so their projection and my wound kind of cooperate to create the the upset my mind is 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 wandering into this space about um uh being hurt in relationship but healing in relationship and this idea around not being able to be in a, a relationship until you're fully healed just laughing because uh we'll have been married 53 years this year and uh if we, had waited, if we had waited to be fully healed we still wouldn't have set the wedding date you know <laughs> Right. Oh, no, no, it's an ongoing process. And as a matter of fact, relationship, I mean, as much as work, as much work as I have done um, in therapy for myself, in helping to heal others, in whatever modalities, you know, in, in spiritual work, whatever, uh, the biggest grant for healing for me and is, has been a relationship, you know, and precisely because, well, in my view, and not only in my view, People always get together with somebody at precisely the same level of woundedness that they're at. You know, that's just a hundred percent law. You know, if, if if I was this wounded and my wife was this wounded, we would never get together. It's like water finding its own level. But oh. that also means, can we then, do we have the consciousness and the commitment to growth and to truth to want to heal together and support one of the, as difficult as it is and as conflictual as it can get do we have the commitment to, to grow together or do we just expect the other person to soothe our wounds mm. and be upset when they don't you know <laughs> so i'd say that the strength of our relationship has been that we've as much as we've had difficulties and my god nobody neither of us would say that we'll heal but boy, we've come a long way, and and it's been the biggest grind of our our, our development is is has been a relationship. Mm. No, no, don't wait until you're fully healed. Yeah. If you do, nobody would ever get into a relationship. 
how do I find someone? Damn it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, obviously relationships are such a big deal. Why is it that they, why are, why is it that they seem to bring out the most in us too? Like they are the, if it, this is only my experience and I think that's, it's probably at least a lot of people's, but why are relationships these spaces where we ultimately get some of our deepest healings? because intimate relationships yeah well look danica you're a very public figure it's impossible not to know something about your history of relationships you know right right in this culture that's the nature of the celebrity culture that we live in you know right um so let me ask you let me ask you a question in a couple of ways okay um one is in relationships that you've been in i'm not asking for names or anything like that but did you ever have a sense that something is not quite right mm -hmm. yeah even a gut sense even before the relationship got too far ahead mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, did you do, what did you do with that gut sense yeah I, I'm I i i said i did i felt like it was just a paranoia or yeah um, it, was, it was you ignored your own gut feelings yeah okay now that ignoring of gut feelings is what gets us into relationships that ultimately can't work okay mm. so it's not a question of how do i find the right person it's how do you pay attention to yourself that ignoring of gut feeling is not anybody's fault it's nothing to condemn or judge yourself for that's an outcome of the childhood experience that i was talking about uh -huh. where we get disconnected from ourselves and so we no longer even know or pay attention to our gut feelings so that's the first part of my answer mm -hmm. it's just Never mind looking for the right person. Get to really know and trust yourself, and don't let your mind and don't let your mind dismiss what your guts and your body and your heart is telling you. Okay. Wow. So that's so that's, yeah. the, so that's the first answer. The second answer is that we always choose people, and this is not original to me. There's a wonderful family therapist called Harville Hendricks, H E N D R I X, and he's been on Oprah multiple times in his order wrote a book called getting the love you want and, mm -hmm. and, he, point, and he points out this he wrote this book after several failed relationships by the way uh he, uh he points out that when we choose a partner we always choose somebody that'll carry some resonance over our childhood relationship to our parents because this kid you you may think you're in love with somebody because they're handsome or pretty or witty or or accomplished or fun to be with and that's but physically attractive that can be true but that's the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. underneath it is when you're a child even if you're an abusive father um or mother whose love did you most want that abusive person's love is who you most wanted that means when you go out there as an adult unconsciously when your energy recognizes that uh, abusive potential in the other person you'll immediately be attracted to them because mm -hmm. that's whose love you wanted mm -hmm. you want to no. write that first wrong no no this is this is unconscious yeah conscious this is why you see so many women who were abused in childhood end up in an abusive relationship as adults and you think you think they'd know better but no, it's because that's the energy that they're drawn to, because that's where we're desperately looking for love as children, and that's where we're desperately looking for love still as adults. So uh, it's not a question of finding the right person. It's a question of finding the right person inside yourself. Yeah. Well, that was the ayahuasca message, the first one. It yeah. was that I was supposed to find the relationship with myself, not with somebody else. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and when you do... Mm -hmm. you find that relationship out there and i've seen that many many times yeah yeah and that was the message too is that you still get everything you want but yeah, it has yeah. to be with you and you first that's right that's right yeah yeah relationships they're very interesting such great teachers well in all of your work um i'm curious what surprised you the most what is the best and worst surprise maybe that's even better what surprises me is how blind I can be, despite all I know. That's that's always the big surprise, you know, because I've learned so much, you know. Uh, yeah. 
and and, and yet I can still be sometimes so blind. <laughs> and that's the biggest surprise. It's always surprising when I think I know something, and I and then I oh, no, what I thought wasn't right, and and how I experienced this didn't really correspond to what happened. It was I was still projecting my own, interp own interpretation into the experience. So that's the biggest surprise is how. Um, Mm. Even after all the learning that I've done, I can still have a distorted sense of reality. Mm hmm. Hmm. So much to learn. What about from other people? Have other people surprised you, or learning more about human? Yeah. Well, experience? so well, absolutely. Look, um, in this book, the myth of normal, I, I I talk about people who real people that I know whose histories I I'm familiar with who've gone through incredible illness uh, to find themselves, you know, that, that whose diseases, rather than killing them, has led them back to their authentic selves. And wow. e or even sometimes as they died of their illnesses. I mean, the most surprising thing you can hear as a doctor is when somebody says to you, um, Doc, this illness, and I used to work in palliative care, Looking after terminally ill people. It's, oh wow! I you know, worked in family medicine, palliative care, and then finally in addictions, and in palliative care, but elsewhere in like in, in my medical path as well. Somebody would say to me, "Doc, this illness that's going to take my life is the best thing that ever happened to me." And you would think, "How can anybody say that?" Right. Nothing. It's nothing. It's not the kind of learning I would wish on anybody. What they were talking about is that through dealing with the illness, they actually got in full contact with themselves and they knew who they were for the first time. Mm. And that to them was more precious than the extent of life itself. Now, I'm not advocating here. I'm only telling you, asking what surprises me. To hear that is always a surprise. The, 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 and more generally speaking, how suffering, how people can be grateful for suffering after they learned the lessons that the suffering bestowed on them. So I, I quote this Greek playwright Aeschylus, who 2,500 years ago in one of his plays said that the way Zeus or the master, or the God created us is that we suffer, suffer into truth. And it always surprises me, impresses me, how people can suffer greatly through an addiction, through a mm -hmm. severe illness, through a life crisis, and they come out grateful for what they've learned. That's always awe-inspiring and surprising. Yeah, thank God for that. Well, maybe as a final sort of topic, because I find it always fascinating when it's spoken about, is the causes of disease. Hmm. Okay. So um, if one is going to be scientific about it, one has to hesitate about talking about single causes, you know, like, you can take tobacco smoking and and and, and uh, sorry cigarette smoking and lung cancer okay it is cigarette smoking the, the cause of lung cancer it seems like it is but the answer it isn't because if cigarette cause smoking was the cause of lung cancer then everybody who smokes should get lung cancer if a is if a is the cause of b Every time you see A, you should see B. If when you see A, B doesn't show up, then A can't be the cause of B. Now, is it a major contributing factor? Sure as heck it is. 95% of people with lung cancer are smokers. So smoker is a major contributor to lung cancer, but you can't say it's the cause. Fair, yep. So, so, so for most conditions, there's a whole bunch of causes. Now, one of the lesser known causes, or I shouldn't say causes, but contributor, contributors, to lung cancer, for example, is the emotional repression. When people repress their emotions because their anger wasn't accepted as children, they had to suppress themselves, they're also suppressing their immune systems. Now, to most doctors, this sounds like crazy talk, but that's only because they haven't looked at the scientific evidence. When we repress our emotions, we're actually messing with our immune systems. So a major contributing factor, I don't say the cause, but a major contributing factor to illness is emotional repression. And, um, for example, if you look at autoimmune disease, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma, lupus, um, fibromyalgia, um, multiple sclerosis, 70, 80% of people with autoimmune diseases are women. 
and who are, and who are the ones in this culture who are programmed to repress their anger and to serve the needs of others is women yeah, and, sure. and, in my, in my, and in my contention that's a major contributor not only is it my contention i can and do cite all kinds of scientific evidence to show that so when we talk about causes we have to look at the multiple things obviously there are causes in the environment i mean we live in an environment that's so full of toxins and pesticides and who knows what we, you can't even keep a track of it you know um dietary factors obviously contribute you know the unhealthy diets that people in this society often um, consume you have to consider that as a cause you know what i'm interested in is something that's largely ignored in medical practice are the emotional and psychological factors that can be to contribute to illness and for which there's a lot of evidence so when i talk about these things i'm not saying that these are the cause i think they're, they're amongst the causes but the important ones and the reversible ones so emotional repression being inauthentic not being in touch with your emotions uh, if i looked at my own experience as a physician and then i looked at all the studies which had, nobody told me about in medical school but they are out there published in major journals by the way so this is not mumbo jumbo medicine i'm talking about there are four characteristics of people that get chronically ill that i noticed people that automatically and compulsively serve the emotional needs of others while ignoring their own okay number one number two number two a compulsive and rigid identification with role and duty and responsibility rather than needs of the self you know so um that, that's the second one the third one is the repression of healthy anger healthy anger is a boundary defense we have to have it the emotions serve as a boundary so does the immune system when we repress healthy anger we're actually messing with the immune system and again that's not my fantasy that's what the studies show that you enter because and this is because and you know i could talk to you about this for a whole day but to encapsulate it mind and body can't be separated so the big one of the huge mistakes that western medicine makes is it ignores the science that shows the mind body unity and it's all one in fact why did they do that because this culture separates mind from the body and medicine is part of the culture because doctors are not trained in this despite all the science because doctors themselves are very traumatized people very often very driven i mean if you look at article in new york times yesterday doctors have amongst the highest burnout rates of all professions they have an early they, they they there's an early death rate with doctors even right i that may be true i don't know but what i can tell you is when you look at the markings of aging in medical students they age faster than their other people their age wow so doctors are just simply not trained to understand themselves how would they understand others you know hmm. and there was a revered medical teacher at harvard whose name is soma weiss he was so revered that to this day at harvard university they have a memorial day in his honor okay and he taught in in the 1930s and in 1938 soma weiss gave a lecture to a medical school class which was published in the journal of the medical medical association in 1940 and he said that emotional factors are at least as important in the causation of illness as physical ones and they must be as important in the healing of them he said this in 1938 four years ago a physician right now at Harvard is still there very well known told me that to talk about mind body health at Harvard is to jeopardize your career he says it's changing but it's still very difficult so I'm telling you medical culture is like no since Soma Weiss made that statement in 1938 there's been what eight decades of research showing the mind body unity and that's almost completely ignored in medical uh in medical training so 
no wonder then that is emotion given the mind body unity and the inseparable um oneness of our emotional apparatus with our immune system and our hormones and our nervous system when something happens emotionally of course it happens physiologically it can't be otherwise right. so the final characteristic of people that get ill then are are people who believe that they're responsible for other people feel and they they believe they must never disappoint anybody and these people with these four traits it's not magical or mysterious it's very stressful to be always serving the needs of others it's very stressful to be repressing your emotion your mm -hmm. your anger it's very stressful to always trying to please others these people tend to get chronic uh, illness a lot of trapped energy yeah it, that's exact suppressed and trapped energy now notice i didn't say this is the cause i'm saying it's a major contributing factor and when people get ill, they often learn not to be that way anymore, and often they can heal, you know? And um, mm. lots, of lots of examples of that as well. So mm. that's, that's what I've learned in my, both in my medical practice, but also, you know, through the, my vast, or I should say my traversal of the vast literature that's out there. Well, it connects to the very beginning of the conversation with um, being met emotionally and, being able to emote and be supported. And that's such a loop to adulthood and the things that we face and the challenges that we have. Um, okay, well, my last question then is is really just a little bit of a more of a spiritual or philosophical question, which is what's, this is hard. Like being human is hard. You think so? Um, I think that there are, I think that it is, you know, I, I originally, if you'd have asked me what what I thought the point of all of this was, it was to experience duality, which is essentially going to imply that there's challenges and there's joys, yeah. um, pain mm -hmm. and joy. Um, I don't know if I always still completely believe that, but but I think that there are. I think by by nature, it seems like this setup of an experience of being a human um, well, does provide a lot of contrast and there's a lot of, and there's, there is, there is pain in there and we can't see ourselves and we have to, it's very difficult to see ourselves. And so we, we get it reflected back from other people and that can create a lot of confusion because again, you can't see yourself that well. So really yeah. the question is, is what's, what is the point of this? What is the point of this glorious and painful ex experience of being a human? the reason i laughed when you said that it's hard to be a human is because um i've kind of i've said this before publicly but i've concocted i've written my own epitaph and uh <laughs> on on my gravestone it's going to be carved it was a lot it was a lot more work than i had anticipated <clears throat> what's the point you know the mind can't answer that one because the mind can say some wonderful things about that um but um I think that's a question that everybody can only answer for themselves. And I don't, I don't think um, anybody can prescribe it for anybody else. But I would venture to think that you have either found an answer or at least approximated an answer that reflects whatever stage you're at right now in your life. So if I said to you, is there a point to existence? I don't imagine you'd say no it's pointless would you of course not no okay so that means that there's something in you that is either have found a point or is convinced or is confident that you'll find it yeah. you know yeah. and that's not the mind that's your whole experience mm -hmm. you know beyond the mind and i would say i could talk about the point of my existence but i can't talk about the point of anybody else but i think it does have to do for all of us on some level with this connection that we're not isolated creatures that this separate soul self is not all there's to us and that the point someone has to do with the very fact that we are that that we exist so our point of existence is our existence and that but 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 that existence is um much greater than the mind would ordinarily imagine it to be now there's just something that came up to for me in response to your question i don't know if that's the truth or not 
but it's just what occurs to me when you ask me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enjoy the ride. Yeah, well, thank you. You too. Yeah, thank you very much. I've followed your work for so long, and I was so excited to talk to you. So thank you for getting up early to do it. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.